Welcome to week 13 of the NHL Power Rankings, where it is pretty much just turned into the Wild West. I mean, the East has been pretty chaotic as well, but the West? Well, let's just say if I was only basing these rankings off how teams have played in the last two weeks, things would look a lot different than they do. So let's just jump right into it, where I'm not going to spend too much time on the two honorable mentions. I have the Flyers and Islanders, who are pretty much still neck and neck after another week. I did have the Islanders just inside the top 10 last week, but they got jumped by a team moving in. Actually, two teams moving into the top 10 while one fell out. For the Islanders and Flyers, though, they're right neck and neck. The Flyers have won more games. The Islanders with 10 loser points already. And the Flyers, I might have given the nudge if they hadn't lost to the Blue Jackets. It was in a shootout, but even a tie to the Blue Jackets is not anything spectacular for a team that's around the top 10, I think, to say the very least. Though I will say this, if you're a fan of one of these teams and don't like that they're just outside of the top 10 rather than inside of it, well, based on how things have been going for a couple of the teams that are currently inside the top 10 and dropping quickly, they could very well either one, if not both of them, be inside the top 10 come next week. And actually, for that matter, the Islanders would have been in this top 10 if it wasn't for the fact that they lost 5-2 to to finish the week to the team that I have in 10th place in the Vegas Golden Knights. Now, for the Golden Knights, they barely kept their spot in this top 10 because of that 5-2 win over the Islanders, but it has not been a good stretch here over these last few weeks through the holidays. As they're currently 3-7 and seven in their last 10, and we're coming off having lost 6 of their last 7 going into that game against the Islanders. And maybe even more concerningly for Vegas, it hasn't just been one problem that's been plaguing them over this last stretch either. Obviously, the goaltending has been an issue with the absence of Hill and Thompson having that injury that kept him out two games, and even since coming back, he's been average to slightly below average. But the scoring has also been a big problem as well, as they did put up five goals on the Islanders, but the Islanders haven't really been themselves when it comes to keeping the puck out of their own net, and in the five games leading into that game, they had scored just eight goals, which is certainly not going to get you very many wins, even though they did manage to get one against an LA team that has also forgotten how to score. And schedule-wise, things aren't going to get much easier for them either over this next stretch, as although they do have five of their next six games at home, they play four of their next five against teams in a playoff spot, and three of those are against Boston, Colorado, and the Rangers. So it's a tough stretch at a time where things are already not going well for this team, and they could very well quickly find their way not only out of this top 10, but maybe into that wild card spot in the West as well. Which already obviously would not be the direction they'd want to be headed in, but especially so considering two of the four hottest teams in the NHL are both in their division and coming up on their heels Still a ways off, but quickly. Now, the Golden Knights are not alone in their struggles of late, not even within their own division and even the top of their own division, as the team that I have in ninth place in the LA Kings has also started to struggle mightily here in the last couple of weeks. Currently, they're on a five-game skid, even if two of those are via shootout, so you can maybe kind of consider them as ties, even if it's still just one point in the standings. Either way, things have not been going particularly well for them here lately. And in spite of the fact that they have been giving up more goals than they were over the course of the season in these last five, averaging three per game, if you don't count the two that come via the shootout, which I personally wouldn't, which is more than they had been giving up, considering even with this last stretch, they still are averaging the fewest goals against per game in the NHL with a 2.37. So the three per game in these last five has definitely brought that back towards the rest of the pack, at least a little bit. It is, however, much more the offensive side of things that has been hurting them, as in this last stretch of games, they've been averaging two goals per game. And again, that's just not something that's going to be getting it done for them. And similarly to Vegas, their schedule over the next couple of weeks isn't doing them any favors either, as they just started a six-game East Coast road trip that sees them playing every other day with a fair amount of travel, and then is capped off at the end of it with a back-to-back -back between Carolina and Dallas. And although Dallas has had their struggles of late as well, which has found them all the way outside of this top 10, with this road trip, including teams like Carolina and Florida, it's not going to be a particularly easy time that they're likely to have. Once again, though, with the Kings on the bright side for them, they too have built themselves a bit of a buffer here to allow for harder times like these. And if they can get back to playing that solid structure that still has them as one of the best five on five statistic teams in the NHL, then they should be able to turn things around and get back to the way things had been going before they get caught by those two teams catching they and Vegas in the division. But one either the Kings or Knights would have been in this top 10 if I was just basing it on how things have gone over the last two weeks. The team that I have an eighth in the Carolina Hurricanes very much still would, 
as things have finally started to consistently turn around for this team, as they're finally getting the results that match how they've been playing. And a large part of that is that their goaltending has finally started to show up giving up just five goals in their three games this week with two dominant wins to start things out. A 6-1 to one win over the Rangers, who spent a long time, and who knows, we'll see what the first spot looks like this week, but have spent most of the season in that first spot, then a 6-2 to two win over a Capitals team, and yeah, they finish it off with kind of drying up offensively to lose to St. Louis in the shootout, but again, there, the part that's been struggling for them in the goaltending still did pretty well and gave them a chance to win. I mean, things have been going so well for the Hurricanes here of late when it comes to keeping the puck out of their net that they are now, even after all the struggles they had for the first couple of months of the season, under three goals per game given up. And if Kachekov and Ranta can continue to give the Canes this same level of goaltending that they've been giving them for most of the last month, well, when it comes to those five-on-five -five advanced stats, for all of the praise that LA has gotten from myself and others for how they've played when it comes to that for most of this season, the Canes have been right on their heels as one of the best teams when it comes to the balanced five-on-five -five stats, both offensive and defensive. They were just having a much harder time finishing, both with the goaltending at one end and putting the puck in at the other end. But now that both of those things seem to have turned around here over especially the last couple of weeks, but again, most of December and the start of January here, well, this is a team that could very well find their way to competing with the Rangers for the lead of the division. Then in the seventh spot, I have the Toronto Maple Leafs, who honestly, now that I look at it, I kind of wish I had put them in eighth and Carolina in seventh, especially considering Carolina just beat them recently. But either way, it's too late for now. So I'll keep Toronto in seventh and Carolina in eighth. But yeah, come this time next week, I'll probably switch them unless one team goes more in one direction and the other in the other. Either way, they're still pretty close to each other, and Toronto has picked things up with three straight wins here in the last week, even if two of them were against teams they really have no business losing to in Anaheim and San Jose. But they did shut out the Kings, so that is at least an impressive victory. And yes, I know I could punish them for having to go to overtime to beat the Ducks, but honestly, that game I think just came down to an otherworldly performance from Dostal, and those things can happen from time to time regardless of what team the goaltender plays for. So I'm not going to punish the Leafs too much for that, considering they did end up getting the win. Had they lost, I probably would have, but they got the win and it's still two points in the standings regardless of how they ended up getting them. Now, obviously, as you probably already well know by now, if for no other reason than I have mentioned it in these power rankings before, the goaltending situation in Toronto continues to be something to watch. Obviously, especially now that Samsonov has been waved down to the AHL level with his well-documented struggles and not even playing at an AHL level, so we'll see if he can turn things around. But it does now mean that the Leafs are completely reliant on Martin Jones until Wool gets back. Now, for what it's worth, Jones has been pretty good for the Leafs in his tenure there so far. He's given up just four goals in the last four games, but it hasn't always been smooth sailing for Jones over the course of his career, even in Seattle last year. It does at least help him that at the other end, Austin Matthews is scoring at a ridiculous rate, 30 goals in 37 games, as well as Nylander obviously having a pretty good season with his 54 points in those same 37 games. And it sounds like a potential long-term extension coming up here in the near future. Not that a mid-season contract extension necessarily affects what's going on, on the ice, but it probably would at least give him some peace of mind and is one less thing for at least his agent to deal with. Moving on though, in the sixth spot, I have the Colorado Avalanche, who certainly at least in this last week were not as good at keeping the puck out of their own net as they gave up 16 goals in three games. Even if half of those did come in an absolute thumping at the end of the week, but even in spite of that, they still have been finding ways to win and get those two points in the standings more nights than not. Even if it has been a bit interesting with two 5-4 overtime wins this week against Dallas and the New York Islanders. And yes, it is true that Colorado's NHL second best offense in goals for per game is pretty much being carried by four players. But at the same time, it's pretty much the four guys you'd expect and it's hard to complain too much when it also means that you have four guys over a point per game all of them over 40 points already on the season. And your best player in Nathan McKinnon is leading the way, second in the NHL in points, already with 65, just under halfway through the season, having played 40 games. Not to mention that three of those guys are on pace for 40 or more goals on the season. So as long as the Avalanche can prevent from fighting amongst themselves in the locker room and keep Nachushkin out of trouble off the ice so he doesn't disappear literally from the team in the playoffs, this is very much a team that is going to have no trouble coasting into those playoffs and probably has their sights set on making sure they're playing the right kind of hockey going into the postseason. 
already here halfway through. And speaking of which, when it comes to teams playing that structured, well, maybe disciplined is the wrong word to use for at least this next team, but very much that playoff style of hockey, there are a few doing it better or more consistently than the team that I have in fifth in the Florida Panthers. The Panthers are very much the hottest team in the East and one of the four hottest teams in the NHL, having won each of their last seven straight and just capped off a week with that stomping over the Avalanche 8-4, to four, which came on the end of three straight games that they had won 4-1. to one. They're still very much getting the excellent goaltending from Bobrovsky. I mean, yeah, he gave up four against Colorado, but we've just mentioned how good Colorado is offensively. But at the same time, and maybe even more importantly for them, they are starting to pick things up and get it figured out offensively at the other end of the ice. And heck, even Matthew Kachuk, who has kind of been the focus for and raising at least of the eyebrows on this team with just five goals up until the end of December, has now scored three here in the last week. And sure, if I told Panthers fans at the start of the season that halfway through, OEL and Kachuk would have the same number of goals, it probably would have been reason for concern, but... It seems like he's started to pick things up, and certainly the rest of the team has as well, no longer just relying on those three guys to generate all of their offense. Well, I guess from a goal standpoint, Verhage and Reinhardt are still pretty much carrying this team, the two of them, with 50 of the team's 123 goals, but at least for Kachuk, even if he's just now started to get things going when it comes to putting the puck in the net himself, he still does have the 35 points thanks to 27 assists, so he's at least in the ballpark of a point per game. And for what it's worth, at least to the advanced stats fans out there, just like the Canes and Kings as well, this is one of the best teams analytically at 5-on-5 five five in the NHL. Plus, they haven't been that bad when it comes to special teams either. And heck, for the Panthers, at the rate they're going, which, at least as far as last 10 game stretches are concerned, their 8-2 and two stretch is the third best in the NHL, it might not be that much longer before they catch the team that's just above them, not only in their division, but in the power rankings, as in fourth, I have the Boston Bruins. Now for the Bruins, they would actually be below the Panthers right now if it wasn't for the fact that they themselves have started to pick things up here over the last couple of weeks to at least stave off that Panthers team quickly catching them. Now admittedly for the Bruins, it wasn't a perfect week and for a team that certainly at least early on in the season found their success through largely being the best in the NHL at keeping the puck out of their own net, to then give up a 6-5 to five regulation loss to the Penguins would be a bit concerning or at least eyebrow raising. If it wasn't for the fact that for a team that couldn't seem to buy a goal going into the Christmas break, I don't know if they got fancy new sticks for Christmas, but they came out of it and in these last six games have scored 30 goals, good for five a game. And even considering that in those six games since the Christmas break, they've won five of them with the lone loss being that one to the Penguins. If they can continue to score at anywhere near that rate and get the combination of Swayman and Olmark to go back to their early season form, this is going to be a team that was as challenging to beat as they were last season. And if they can do that with also how the Panthers have been playing lately, it could not only make this race for the top of the Atlantic very interesting, but it could make it the race for the top of the East as a whole. Of course, if that's going to be true, both of these teams will have to go through the team that I have in third in the New York Rangers. And so obviously, yes, with the Rangers in third, it does mean that their reign atop these power rankings, which has lasted the last five, maybe six weeks, has finally come to an end with them dropping two spots, not necessarily because they've been playing terribly, they're still 6-3-1 over their last 10, but it just hasn't been the same dominating, consistent win after win like we saw through most of November and December, as they have started to now kind of go every other, and in this last week, they did go 1-1-1 one, one, one with two losses. One being a complete blowout loss to Carolina, that 6-1 loss, and the other one, a 3-2 overtime loss to Montreal, which it's an overtime loss, but it is also to Montreal. Okay, sorry, it was a shootout loss to Montreal, so I guess a little bit better, but it's still a team that the Rangers should be able to beat and get two points in the standings rather than just one, even if a shootout is still a dumb way to end a game. And besides, even with that, their one win this week was against a Blackhawks team that, if it wasn't for San Jose, may very well be the worst team in the NHL, especially now that they don't have Bedard. Now for the Rangers, do I think this last stretch of more mediocre play is anything for them to worry about? No, not necessarily. They are still playing pretty well. Points in seven of their last ten games, like I already mentioned, and six wins. Of course, if they continue to struggle with at least three of their next five games against some of the hottest teams in the NHL, 
then it still wouldn't really be much to worry about, even if it does mean they could relinquish the top spot of the division. But this is still a team, even with what could be considered a bad stretch for them, is still playing more than well enough to easily be one of the best teams in the East. Of course, with that being said, as I've mentioned a couple of times over the weeks, even with the success that they've had in the standings and getting wins more nights than not, their underlying advanced five on five stats aren't necessarily anything to write home about. In fact, they're almost smack dab NHL average when it comes to both offense and defense. Fortunately, their special teams have been more than making up for the difference as their power play has been one of, if not the best in the NHL and their penalty kill has been pretty good as well. So as long as they can continue to play that well on special teams and get consistent goaltending from Shesterkin, which was kind of an issue this last week, then they should have no trouble continuing to be in this spot, still the top team in the East by these power rankings. Which does then mean, obviously, that these last two teams are both in the West, and actually the Rangers are the top rated American team for my power rankings, as both of these last two are also north of the border. Starting with, in second place, the Vancouver Canucks. And for the Canucks, they did have their chance to potentially claim that top spot and probably would have if it wasn't for their 2-1 to one loss midweek to the Blues, a Blues team that has been beating some of the NHL's best teams here of late, so an impressive run from them. But Vancouver still did manage to just stay in this spot, getting jumped by a team, but also jumping another in the Rangers to stay here in the second spot, thanks to a couple of at least relatively convincing wins on either end of that loss to the Blues, starting off their week with a 6-3 win over the Senators, and then finishing it with a 6-4 win in the second Hughes Bowl. Or actually kind of turned into more of the Miller Bowl with four goals by guys with the last name of Miller, even though they're not related as far as I know in any way but it is obviously going to be known as the Hughes Bowl with the three Hughes brothers involved. Anyway, regardless of what you want to call that game, the second meeting with them and the Devils, they were able to survive a late push by the Devils to tie things up and ended up winning that one, even if it wasn't Demko's best performance ever. In fact, this last week wasn't necessarily his best, although he was still pretty good and I would say very much still in that Vesna conversation. And even with him not having his best game, they still found a way to win, scoring, well, five goals at five on five, and then the one empty netter at the end. And of course, for the Canucks, who do have a pretty interesting matchup coming up here on Monday against the Rangers, they certainly have to like how things are going, not only because they keep finding ways to win games or at the very least pick up points in just about every game they play, but now the two teams that were sticking right with them for this lead in the Pacific are starting to fall off and that gap is starting to open up, giving them a very good chance to just keep doing what they've been doing all season and end up taking this Pacific division without too much of a worry. And their chances of doing so are certainly helped by continuing to be the best team in the NHL offensively, the best goals for per game, and the fourth best at keeping the puck out of their net in goals against per game. Even if their five on five stats continue to be well, defensively pretty good, but offensively mediocre. Or at least with the advanced stats anyway, when it comes to the actual results, they've definitely been exceeding what the advanced stats would predict, thanks to being the best team when it comes to shooting percentage by 2%, sitting at 13.5% shooting percentage still halfway through the season. And then at the other end, obviously, Demko's performance means that their defensive finish has been fantastic as well. So then, as I'm sure you have figured out by now, in first place, it is the Winnipeg Jets. And I know Jets fans were all up in the comment section last week saying the Jets should have been first last week, but I still just don't think they had quite earned it at that point. But with four more wins this week, yeah, they've definitely claimed their spot on the top of these power rankings as the team that has not only got one of the best records and the most points in the NHL at this point in the season, but also is playing the best hockey or certainly tied with it as their 8-0-2 record over their last 10 is only equaled by one other team in the NHL. Of course, that has to be, and I have to mention it, the Seattle Kraken. So they're finally getting going. Unfortunately, with how the start of December and end of November went, there's still a bit of a hill to climb for the Kraken to get into these power rankings, though I certainly considered an honorable mention for the Kraken and the Oilers, two of the hottest teams in the NHL. But anyway, to get back to the Jets and not steal the spotlight too much and spend more time talking about the team that I wish was in first place in the Kraken, for the Jets, it continues to be a dominating stretch that they've been on, scoring plenty of goals even without their best offensive player still on the IR for an extended period of time. And obviously, a lot of that is the performance of Hellebuck in net, as this team still has not given up two goals in regulation since 
the late part of November. All of which continues to climb them right up those rankings when it comes to best teams in the NHL at keeping the puck out of their own net in goals against per game. As they're right up there now against the Kings for that top spot, just .03 behind the Kings at 2.4 to the Kings 2.37 given up per game. And heck, even if you do want to take more of a what have you done for me lately type of attitude and look at just the last 10 games where again, they're 8-0-2, actually a 12 game point streak for them, a 10-0-2 in their last 12. But in the last 10, their 18 goals that they've given up in that stretch is second best in the NHL in that stretch. Once again, to the Seattle Kraken who've given up just 13 in that time. Because Joey Decord is an absolute man among boys, even in spite of his age kind of pointing the other. But anyway, Staying with the Jets, this team is playing absolutely incredible hockey, especially considering that notable injury to Kyle Connor, which honestly just doesn't seem to have phased them. They've almost played even better with him being out, knowing that they have to be a little bit more on that structure and consistent play without that top scorer for them. But again, even with that relatively balanced and consistent offensive attack that still is right around the top third of the league in goals for per game, still the obvious story with this team and the reason that they are where they are is Connor Hellebuck. And it certainly makes that extension that they signed him to here in the off season look all the much better as he is clearly, I would say at this point, the front runner for the Vesna even if Demko is still kind of in that conversation. And if it wasn't for his injury, Aiden Hill would be as well. But Hellbuck is starting to kind of run away with things. And it is a top spot for the Jets in these power rankings that they really should have no trouble keeping come this time next week, as their only tough game is against the Flyers on Saturday, with the two games before that, between now and then, being against the Blue Jackets and Bedardless Blackhawks. So if they do manage to lose especially one of those first two games, then maybe they do drop out of this top spot, but at least for now, it is certainly theirs and it is very well earned. With that being said though, let me know what you think down in the comment section about these power rankings, who your top 10 teams would be, if you might have teams like the Kraken or Oilers, given what they've done recently and ignoring what they did early on in the season, or just how you felt about where teams were in this top 10, if there's teams you would have moved up, moved down, things that I missed in talking about the teams. Love to know your thoughts and until next time, as always, if you have made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like or enjoy the video, there are buttons for that kind of stuff down below that help support the channel. Like and subscribe, of course, I'd appreciate you using them. And as always, stay safe out there, be good to each other, God bless, and go Kraken! They're gonna get into this top 10. I hope, anyway. I mean, I am at least starting to believe that they could eventually make it into the top 10, so that's more than I could have said a month ago.